Hey, it's BT with Tales from a Gemini. My guest today is Torin Collins. He's a Canadian uh, racer who's going to be racing the uh, Moto America Super Sport Division this year. And he's got great stories, stories of redemption, uh, doubting himself, and then he pulled himself up, and now, man, he's on the sunny side of his racing career. And I'm expecting big things from this guy. So you're going to love Torin Collins from Alberta, Canada. Yeah, I'm going to give you your flowers now. I'm going to say right now, I'm going to say right now, you're going to put pressure on Zabi Forez. I'm going to say you're going to upset him. How about that? How about that? You're going to upset him. I hope so, yeah. <laughs> hey, it's BT with Tales from a Gemini. And this guest, oh my, I'm so glad he's Canadian nice because he's been waiting and waiting. And he woke up early uh, just for me and he's been waiting. But now we're started. This is my man, the Canadian Storm from Calgary, Mr. Torrin Collins. Torrin, how you doing there, buddy? I'm doing great. I'm really happy to be here and looking forward to this. Man, me too. You know, we had technical difficulties the first time and then the second time on our end. So I'm finally glad to finally get it. And I think everything happens for a reason. And I researched you before and I did it again last night. And let me tell you something, man. You are into something. I mean, you have, uh, first of all, being from Canada, you don't get, when I first saw you on, on uh, I don't know where it was, I was going down to do social media, scrolling like a creeper that I am, looking for guests, whatever. And I said, okay, this motorcycle race, I go, Canada. And I, honestly, I, I, that, that's, uh, that's the, maybe the American in me, the guy go, Canada, a superbike racer from Canada. And I said, I got to have this guy on because you don't hear about that. You don't hear about Canadian racers. So, I'm glad to have you on, and I just want to know what possessed you to say, you know what, I want to be a, a, a racer, a road racer from Canada and go over and take on the best in the world. Yeah. Well, it started off with my dad, so he's, he's British, um, mm -hmm. and so they moved over, him and my mom moved over here to Canada, and he was racing bikes over in England too, um, and he basically started, there's a little club here in, in Canada, so there's, there's a bit of a racing action here, but... It, you only have like a couple months in the summer and then it gets too snowy to actually do it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, basically I started like most other um, road races do on a small little CRF 50 on the go-kart track. Um, and I just built from there and the uh, winning races. And then when I was 12, because I have two passports, that's when the British Talent Cup came in. And then I was like, okay, you know what? I could, I could race against some of the best. I can, I can try and get better and do the best I can now. Um, and that's where making racing my my like full-time thing my my goal came as the reality rather than just a dream i mean but so walk it back you you skipped it like when you first got on the bike when did you go this is what i want to do because sometimes as a kid you do it for a little bit like anything else and then you go on to something else but what made you stick with that um it's honestly probably the, the, the that i was doing really good in it um because mm -hmm. i'm quite competitive and i think if i was if I was not great at racing and I was like, just, just having fun or whatever, I probably wouldn't have stuck with it. But it's the fact that I was like, I won, I think on my second or third year of racing, I won the provincial championship. And then when I was, I think I was nine, um, I won the national championship. And then it was like, I think when I was 12, it was seven national championships. So it was just, it was me, me winning the races that made me continue. And then it, and then I started falling in love with the speed and the, the I guess, the art of racing, which was, it was mainly the, the results that were making me uh, love it. Now, what other sports were you doing at the time? Were you, do, were you doing like your, are your traditional uh, Canadian, like hockey and, and um, what's the other one then with the, with the broom? What's the, uh, curling. You're, do you do curling also? I, I've never done curling, but I did hockey, soccer. I did quite a bit of gymnastics, too, for quite a while. What sport do you think helps you in uh, motorcycle racing? Uh, I'm going to say gymnastics has to be probably. Yeah, so I did gymnastics the longest out of, other than racing, out of all of the sports that I did. I did it from when I was, I'd like to say six until 12. Um, so I did, it, I did it for quite a big chunk of my life, I guess. And the main thing was how flexible I was. So like I was able to like move around the bike really easily. Yes. Um, the core strength too. It's a, it's a big thing. And it was also every time I would crash, I wasn't getting hurt. Like, and I still don't Mo all these other guys that I've raced against, they've got collarbone snap, they've got broken bones, pulled muscles, everything. I've been pretty lucky to only have broken my foot once, um, in a race. And other than that, I've been, I've been really injury free. So yeah. 
It's because you know how to crash and roll. Is that, that yeah. it? Yeah, exactly. And also, because in gymnastics, you do a lot of falling. Yes. Your body's used to, to taking those rolls and to, to taking those, like, those falls, I guess, um, and being thrown around. So I'm, I was used to it. So when it would happen, my muscles weren't like, we're doing the right things to make sure that I wasn't getting injured. And what, what made you want to get into gymnastics at, at that age, at six? Because at six, you know, you're just tumbling, you know, maybe doing a cartwheel here and there. So what made you go, I want to do this for a sport? Um, I think it was actually my parents. My Because both my sisters did gymnastics as well. They were like, okay, let's put Torin into it. Um, so I don't think it was, that wasn't necessarily my choice. <laughs> um, but I, I did enjoy it for a, I for I enjoyed it for most of it, and then by the end, I was like, okay, I don't really want to do this anymore. I want to <laughs> stop racing. Well, you know, yes, a good way to meet the girls. You know, they're tumbling, you're tumbling. Yep, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't mean, I didn't mean to catch you by surprise there, Dort, but. <laughs> He was like, yeah, I mean, no, but I think of all the sports, it makes sense because like you said, it's that nimbleness. I mean, I feel that from doing like I've, I've changed my workout a little bit now. You know, I do yoga. I still do yoga, but I still do. But I do more movement now. And I feel that too. my body. Like if I fall, I, I mean, hopefully I won't fall when I'm racing, but I feel like when I'm, you know, that I'm more limber or whatever. Mm -hmm. And yeah, what it's was all your about being able to like to make sure your body's doing the right stuff, basically, when something bad happens. What, what what was your best event in gymnastics? Um, I was pretty decent at the rings. I was I was pretty good at that. Um, I was really like I was. I even I look back at it now. I was really strong back then for my age. Yeah, like I was only like eleven or twelve, and I could do the the iron cross thing and the thing where you do that. No, we do yeah, we used to do that as like little kids. I thought that was. I look back on it now, and I'm like, how did we do that? You did the iron cross. Yeah. Don't always. lie to me. Don't lie to me, Torin. Don't lie to me. Don't lie to me. There's like seven of us that we all used to do it. People don't realize how hard that is. I, I go to the gym now. And there was some rings at some gym I was just at, and I couldn't even get up on just to get like this. I can imagine doing as a kid. No, yeah. There was, there was some stuff that I look back on. Like my dad took videos of me competing and stuff. And I'm like, I could not even do that now if I tried. Like, I'm, I'm not strong enough to do that. How's your grip? How's your grip strength though? How's your grip strength? Right now, my grip strength's pretty good. Back then, it was crazy. It was it was crazy strong. You're just because like okay. I guess I I go to the gym, but it's not so much. I'm not I'm not like I'm I'm not like a gym head. Like I'm not always trying to pound out weight and everything like that. Yeah, and um, all that. But I mean, I'm strong still. I'm quite fit. Um, but back then, for my for my size, for my for my weight, for like my body strength was was unreal. Now, now, when did you know that you had a little bit something different that, that you go, I mean, like you said, you're winning championships in Canada, whatever. And you said, you know what? I think I have enough to go overseas and give it a go. Yeah. Well, it was definitely the British Thailand Cup because for me, that was my first step into Europe. Mm -hmm. And so going in, my dad told me, my, my, my friends, anyone who told me, they're like, okay, you're going against the Europeans now. So you're probably not going to do very well. Um, and then I was I was battling for top rookie every race. I think in the end I I got like I didn't finish as the top rookie at the end of the year. I think I was like third or second best rookie. Um, but it was then when I was like, okay, hold on, I'm actually I'm not at the back. I'm at the front for these new guys, and I'm doing pretty decent. And um, that's when I realized it's like, oh, you know what? I might be able to I might be able to take this elsewhere. Um, and there was a couple highlights in my season two where I qualified fifth on the grid at Snetcherton. Um, yeah. And I was like, because usually I'm pretty bad at qualifying. I'm Why is that? Like, Why? I don't, I don't know. It's, I've been trying to figure it out. Me and my dad, the teams I've been on, every time we're like, why can't I put in one fast flying lap? But as soon as I'm in the race or there's someone right there or there's like a carrot, I drop like a second, like it's nothing. And yes. it's in qualifying, I struggle to do it. I can't put in that my best lap. I always do it in practice or in or in the race. Well, can you, have you thought about following somebody? Oh yeah, in junior GP, that's all you do. You follow. You're on someone's rear wheel every single lap of every single session. So, so even in qualifying, I mean, I know people hate that, but you just go, "Hey, I'm sorry, but I got to get the pole." So you get behind them and yeah, absolutely. That's what it is. And I think 
there's always drama with it too. There's always someone getting mad, someone <laughs> yeah, yeah, giving yeah. you the middle finger because you're following them or whatever. But yeah. everyone, everyone's doing the same thing. You you look behind you, someone's behind, someone's, someone's on your tail. Yeah. In front of you, there's someone following someone else. You're following them. It's just a train of everyone trying to put in a lock over there. Have you ever, have you ever uh, had to uh, drop the gloves, as they say in hockey, I, over there in uh, racing? I know uh, we, they have what they call the red mist. I know you're Canadian. They call Canadian nice. But there's got to be somebody that pissed you off enough where you got pissed off and go, you know what? And you dropped the gloves. You ever had to do that over there? I've never had to, like, actually fight someone. Yeah. But, yeah, as much as I'm Canadian, I do have a bit of a short temper sometimes. <laughs> I do. I do. I think the whole Canadian being nice thing, yeah, we're quite polite in our manners, I guess. Yeah. But when we're competitive, oh no, we're like, we're probably not, not we're probably one of the least nice, like I have to say, honestly. When we get <laughs> mad, like the Canadians go crazy when you get mad. <laughs> I love how he said, least, he was nice saying they're not nice. He goes, we're the least nice. I love that. He was, <laughs> I love it. I guess when it's competitive, I, yeah. wouldn't, I wouldn't assume for a Canadian to be nice. Well, who, who, who pissed you off enough? Like, when was the last red mist that you had that you just, like, you were so close? Like, you couldn't keep it together. You had to go, okay. <sighs> who pissed you off? And what was the situation? It's not a particular rider. It's just there's so much shenanigans going on in Junior GP. There's always, there's always someone, like, doing something dumb. Or you're on a fast lap, and there's, like, four of you, and you're all on a flying lap. And then some guy just decides, you know what? I'm tired. Let me just sit up in the middle of the track. And now we have to, and over there, one tenth is four positions. Like it's, it's crazy. So one second of you having to move, not in the right position, your lap's destroyed. You're like, you're like, okay, now I can't, um, now I'm not going to improve or whatever. So there's lots of times where I've been like, yo, what's this guy doing? Like, why is he just in the middle of the track? And I'm like, I've, I've gotten mad and like, I've thrown my hands up. I've, I've given the middle finger to someone before I've. <laughs> I've purposefully gone extra close to someone just to be like, you know what? You're, you just messed up my lap. Let me mess up yours. Wow. Uh, really? It, it happens. It's, it's surprising, but it happens more than you think. Like all those guys who in junior world championships, all of them can relate. We all, we all have done something like that. We've all gone so mad at someone, someone who's a little bit slower than you or whatever. They're not even doing anything wrong, but they're just slower than you and you catch them. Now, for some reason, you've got so much anger towards this one person just for being a little bit slower than you. You're like, oh, yeah, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of anger I've had in the past couple of years. I love it, man. Who is the biggest jerks uh, over there? Is it like, maybe it's just, is it one like particular, like the, maybe it's the Spaniards since they run everything now? Or is it like maybe the Italians? I know they have a little temper. So, or is it just the individual? Um, well, I don't want to like assume everyone, um, but it has to be definitely the Spanish, definitely the Italians and the French. I'm really? not a big the French. No. Um, like just as, as the couple riders that I've, I've ridden with, I've, I've raced against. Yeah. Not a big fan. Um, just they're, they're like, they're just, I don't know. There's something about them. There's all, all three of those countries. They're very confident, which is important. It's important to be confident. Yeah. But they're quite arrogant a lot of the time. <laughs> it is, it's because they're good. It's because they're fast. That yeah. they, they have the right to be arrogant and cocky. And they know that they're good and better than most of the people out there. And so that's, that's, that's just the way they've been grown up racing and everything. But it's, yeah, it shows, it shows in their riding a lot. It's a bit, yeah. You, there's a lot of, with the internationals, the Australians, the Americans, the, the Dutch, the all of them, we all we all have a little bit of uh, anger towards the French, the Spanish, the Italians, just because they're they're so fast. <laughs> so it's like World War Three on the track, huh? Oh yeah, oh yeah, for sure. So that being said, do you feel like that you uh, do you feel do you like the fact that you're carrying the mantle for Canada, and maybe you can be the the, the person that maybe kickstarts a little movement in Canada with road racing? You know what I mean? Do do you feel that? Um. Yes. I, I wish though that I didn't live in a place that's so cold. Um, just you to know. make it easier for me, it makes it difficult. Um, we always have to travel somewhere new. We have to find a different place to go spend laps just because we're lucky if we get started up in April. Um, that's like, and it's going to be cold. It's going to be pretty miserable weather then. So it's usually June when you can actually start spinning laps. And that's just my season starts in April for Motor America. 
Yeah, uh, right. that's my first race, so it's it's too late for me. That's why we're going to Spain to spin laps. But to represent Canada, I'm I'm quite proud to be Canadian. I, I make sure I show it off on my on my name, on my butt patch, my helmet, everything. There's got to be a Canadian flag. It's it's red and white. Um, see, I'm pretty I'm pretty happy to be Canadian and representing Canada. And it's it's good to help. There's a couple of young Canadians too that look up to me, um, and that see what I've done, and they want that. They want to do the exact same. And honestly, it's it's hard because they. I don't think a lot of them understand the struggles and the difficulty of being over in Europe. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy and proud to be to be representing Canada over and overseas and in any situation. I'm happy to be Canadian. So you're basically like a role model to those guys. And, you, I mean, you never realize it until, like you said, then they say something to you. You go, wow, this, this person kind of looks up to me. I kinda, it kind of gives you a little bit more of a, of a oomph, you know? Yeah, for sure. And there's only a couple of them, too. There's, I'd say maybe in my province, there's, there's one kid who's like 16, and there's a couple that are like 10. Um, and they're, pretty, they're fast in Canada aspect. Um, and it's... It's just them trying to get them seen over in Europe just to see the level change because racing in Canada, the guys are, you'd say, oh, they're, they're quick. They know what they're doing, but they just get demolished over in Europe. And I think it's, it's quite, it checks your ego a lot too. Like even in the British Talent Cup, mm -hmm. I was, when I started doing good and then all of a sudden some, the fastest guy like Scott Ogden or one of the really fast guys fly by me, like I'm standing still. I'm like, oh, okay, wow. Like I'm... Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm fast, but I've got like, I've got another second at least in me. Well, so, yeah. I, I, it's, I always say this. I always ask every racer this. And the best response was ever was uh, Sean Dillon Kelly. I said, what was your best oh shit moment? And for him, it was, he said, he said he was in Red Bull Rookies Cup and he's just on it. And he's thinking, okay, I'm breaking. I'm doing well. And Raul Fernandez comes by him like, Phew, and he goes, that's what I got to do. <laughs> and he, he passed on the outside of a quarter. So what's your biggest oh shit moment where you go, oh my God. It, yeah, it's definitely junior GP. Um, mm -hmm. Probably just any of the fast guys. It's almost every race weekend you get one of the like Angel Piqueras or um, Cruces or any of the fast guys. They fly by you like you're standing still and then they gap you in like, and all the small bikes, it's, it's not easy to like gap someone. Like it's, to gap someone pretty like quickly, mm -hmm. you have to be significantly faster than just because there's not much power and there's not much difference in, in your lines or anything. And it's just them able to, they're, they're finding the speed that I can't find. Like I'm stuck at like a certain nap time and I'm like, dang, how do I, how do I improve? And then these guys fly by me, fly by me. And I'm like, oh, like it's, it's almost every race weekend that I'm, that I get the, one of those, oh shit moments. <laughs> I'm like, damn. like, every time I feel like I'm doing good, I'm like, Okay, well, I'm not doing good enough. Like, this guy's faster than me. So, yeah. Of all the guys you race with or whatever, and I know there's a lot of talent, a lot of talent, but you just mentioned Angel Piquet, who I think, who I, I'm just going to go on a limb and say he's going to do some, he's going he's gonna to be known big time really soon. I think he's got that kind of talent. But if, if you have raced with, what guy sticks out in your mind that you go, this guy right here? Um... Dude, but you I saw think him it's actually Carpe, Alvaro Carpe. Really? I don't know. I've raced against him in every category in, in Europe other than British Talent Cup. Like I was racing against him in European Talent Cup when he was in there. And he's, he's a bit younger than me. I think he's like one or two years younger than me. Um, but it was the first practice session in European Talent Cup back in 2020. This little kid was coming up to me and he was bumping me on the straight. And it was, he was, I'm like... Like what? This is like my first practice session of the year in Estoril, and this kid got. And I'm like, ever since I've been racing against him in all for the past four years, I've been I've been racing against him, and it's every time I'm thinking, he always one ups me, and he's always better than me, and but but not just by a little bit too. He's always faster than me by quite a bit, and I'm always like, how has he done that? Like how is he quicker than me? So yeah. Now, how did you not lose the faith in me? Because I know you went a long way. I think you've been over there, what, four years, I think? And, you know, you went from team to team, whatever. I mean, there, there was results, don't get me wrong, but I probably not the ones like you wanted to have. So how did you keep from just, like, going, okay, I'm done, or I did the best I could? What made you just keep on keeping on? Um, There was always 
it was always the little the shivers of hope that would show me, oh, you know what? If I, like when I got my first points in junior world championships, that was when I was like, I was, I was in a group and the next group in front of me was the battle for the win. And I was like, okay, hold on. Like, I'm actually not very far away from, from being at the front. And it was, that's when it was kind of like, I'm so close yet so far at the same time. Mm -hmm. So don't get me wrong. I've definitely doubted myself a lot in the past four years. Um, I've thought about like at before this season, I was thinking, you know, I might, I might step back and just like, I might just, I've tried, I tried in junior world championships. That's one of the highest things I could probably get to. And I thought about maybe like just hanging up the suit. Um, but then it was, I think for now on the Moto3 bikes, I'm done. I'm done on the Moto3 bikes for sure. I'm not, I've tried over there. I've tried on those bikes. So I think in that aspect, I'm done. I've, I've, I'm happy with what I've achieved, not the results that I wanted, but the experience and being against those guys is, is plenty to me. I've been, I've been racing against, I, I have to say the best in the world. Um, and I think now seeing what I did at Coda in September, um, getting on the podium then definitely showed that it's not that I'm not good enough. It's just, maybe I don't fit with that motor three bike. Maybe I'm, I'm just not clicking with that, those tracks, that, that bike, that competition, um, and being on a production bike, a bigger bike that fits me more. It gave me that bit of like that push to be like, you know what, let's try another year. Let's see what I can do. Um, let's see if I can put it on the box as much as possible, finish top three in the championship. Um, that's really the goal for me is it's that gave me the hope that I was like, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to continue. Um, so I'm not going to lie and say that I, I'm, I, I had complete faith in myself the entire time over there yeah. uh, because there's lots of times that I was like, I can't do this. I'm not good enough. Uh, but yeah, I guess it's just, it's just deep down that little bit of that little bit of sparkle that's still in you that keeps you going. When, when did it get bad to where you go? Maybe I'm not, you know, maybe good enough, or maybe this just this ain't working. Like, when did it, at your worst moment, when did it get bad? Um, well, I know it was definitely not in any of my two rookie years, the first year in European Talent Cup and my first year in Junior GP. Mm -hmm. I took every time I, something bad happened or didn't go well, I took that as, it's my first year. It's, it's a learning um, experience. But I'd say this year was probably the most, just, and it was the first couple rounds, like the first round I crashed, um, the second round, I got my first points. So that was, a, it was a good start to the season for me. Yeah. And then it was kind of around the Hareth round. I had a big crash in testing um, and it, it was straight after getting the points too. So the team thought I'd be up on a high. This was my chance to break through. I was going to start being consistent and everything. And then I just demolished the bike in Hareth. I like bent the frame. The team owner said I should have broken my back in the crash. Um, just because how big of a crash it was. And it just completely knocked my confidence, honestly. Um, and it was for the next couple rounds, it was the same results. I'd qualify at the back. I'd finish, not last, but I'd be like 20, 21st almost every race. And I'm just like, mm, it's not it's not very good. Um, and even though I try, I try, I try, the results and the speed just wasn't really getting there. And I think that's when I was like, well, what am I doing next year? What am I what, what am I going to be doing? Cause I can't, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to improve over here. I'm going to be stuck at the back if I did it, do another year. Um, see, I was probably the last like half of the year I was really struggling. Um, and I wanted to give up like a lot. Like I was like, Oh, what's the point? Why are we over here? We're putting so many sacrifices, um, into this. And my parents have put so much into it, but it's just, we're not getting the results. Um, but, and that's how racing is. You don't get the results. You get, don't feel the confidence. You're not, you're not making any improvements. Of course, you're going to be down in the gutter and you're not going to know what to do. Cause I, I didn't know how to improve. Honestly, I was like, I was lost. Um, and then, yeah, I was really the thought of going to a bigger bike. Like the, I got, I had a couple options to maybe do the European moto two mm -hmm. um, on a bigger bike. And I thought about that, but I just, didn't have any experience on like bigger bikes yet to even make that commitment over in Spain and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's the production bike. I thought that would be the way to go and being at home too. 
I just needed, it's a bit of a refresh for me this year um, to try and try something new to see if I can um, make a, di- like make a difference in my racing and see if I can actually start getting those results and showing that all the effort and work I put in is worth it. Who'd you have to talk to? Like, like when you're down, you know, like, did you have anybody you could confide in? It was like, you know, say, Hey, it's going to be okay. Or, or anybody. Cause I know it, people don't know how hard it is to go to another country, another language. And maybe your team is either Italian or, or, or Spanish. And even though they speak a little, you know, it's still hard to get at language barrier and different kind of food, the culture, and then you're not getting the results. So who did you have to turn to? Um, if honestly, I don't like when people tell me, oh, it's okay, you're doing okay or whatever. I don't like that. I yeah. find that that actually annoys me a lot when someone, if I'm having a bad race or like I'm stuck in this gutter and I'm like, I'm not getting the results. Someone tells me, oh, it's okay. That actually makes me more annoyed just because I'm like, well, I'm not, it's not okay. I'm not doing well. Um, I need someone to be real with me. And my mom, she was there with me. She's not super into biking herself. Like she's, yeah. she doesn't know much about it. But she's a she's a leadership coach. So she she yeah, basically she was able to tell me, like, get your shit together, Torin. Nice. Uh, nice. Be positive. Like, like I don't care if you're doing bad or good. You don't need to be positive. You don't need to be thinking bad about yourself. Just think about how you're gonna get better. So yeah, my mom was really, really good at being real with me too. She's not, she doesn't bullshit me. If I'm doing bad, I'm doing bad. Um nice. Which is actually how I prefer it, honestly. I like your mom. Oh, I, I like her. I, I do. I like that. Don't but you get your shit together. That's great, man. You can, you need that every now and then. That little, that little shake like this to get you out of that little, you know, rut. Yeah, for sure. And also my uh, my crew chief was like that too. He I was with him for two years. And um, the first year he was trying to be nice about everything. He's like, oh, it's okay. Don't get mad. Don't get frustrated. And then the second year he was like, I'm not going to lie to you. You wrote like, you wrote shit. You didn't ride well. Um uh, how are we going to, what, how are you going to get better? Cause on those bikes, there's only so much you can actually change on the bike. The rest is just yourself. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, he was very good at also being real with me and I need someone to tell me, Torin, you're doing bad. You're not doing very well. You need to, you need to basically fix what you're doing and then we need to get the results. Right. And that's the, him and my mom together were really helpful. Um, just, even though, even though it was, we were still stuck for a couple of the rounds, that's what I needed. Um, I needed someone to tell me to be to be real with me and to tell me what to do. So, um, yeah, shout out to Tony, my uh, <laughs> my crew chief or my old crew chief. Well, here's what, and fast forward. Here's what I think, and correct me if I'm wrong. I just think when you got the call or whatever to come over and do that wild card in at uh, at Coda. And you basically lit it up, and that had to that had to be the biggest relief and weight off your shoulders to tell tell you I have arrived. And yeah, I got the talent. I just like you said, I need a little refresh. Am I right on that? Oh yeah, absolutely. It was it was game changing, honestly, because I was I said to my parents, I I, I basically said before that race, um, I said if this doesn't go well, like if this wild card doesn't go well, I think I'm done. Like I'm done racing. Um, and I told that to them and there was a, there was a bit of pressure around it. My dad was like, yeah, there was, there's quite a bit of pressure on this wild card, by the way, Torin. like, if you, if this doesn't go well, then we're done basically. So, um, so no pressure or anything. Um, and yeah, it was, we were real with the goal. We were like, we, we considered a oh, top 10 would be I, like, basically if you don't finish in the top 10, that's really disappointing Torin. Um, like I was, I, if I didn't finish in the top 10, I'd probably cry. Honestly, I'd be like. I'd, I'd be all, I'd feel awful and top five, like everyone was telling me, Oh, you'd be lucky to get in the top five for the, like for the results, you'd be lucky for that. Um, and it was, yeah, first practice top P five. And I was like, Oh, okay. Wow. Like I was like, I'm actually doing, oh, this is pretty good, but it's just practice. And then Q1 and I was P3 and I was like, okay, like I, I might actually have a chance at being on the podium. Um, and each time that I get a good result through that weekend, it was more, more like weight off my shoulders. And I, I felt, I actually, I think I felt like I was walking taller. Like I felt like, okay, like I, I'm, I'm finally for once puffing out my chest a little bit and, and being confident, not arrogant or cocky, but actually being like proud of myself in what yes. I'm doing. Um, and yeah, first race when I finished fourth, I came in and I was like, whoa, like I was like, I was like, oh yeah, like that's great. Um, 
and there was a couple of the guys that got mad at me, like other riders who weren't happy with me just due to my my aggressive riding style. Um, but, <laughs> oh, who was yeah. it? Who was it? Come on, tell us. It was uh, Dave Anthony. He's okay. a old older guy. Um, he's like a veteran in the class. Yeah, no. he was. He wasn't very happy with me after the race. <laughs> well, you had your dad, would you? So your dad could take him, right? Your dad could take him, right? If you got, if you got I don't know about that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I feel, Dave, Dave's kind of scary, honestly. When he was at, like, after the race, because we came into Park for Man, he came off and he was like, he was like, hey, man, you're way too aggressive out there. And I was like, and he was like, if you ride like that, I'm going to do that to next race and everything like that. And, um, I was, I was, I was honestly, I was pretty like, oh no, like, oh no, I was, I was, I was, I was a bit scared. Um, and then, but I was a bit, I was a bit like, my dad said I was a little shit with the way that I responded. <laughs> What'd you I, say? What'd you say? What'd you say? Like, like, the first time I was just like, oh, it's just racing. And like, just shrugged. I was like, it's just racing. Um, and then when he said, oh, okay, well, if that's how you want to ride, I'll do it next race. And I said, I said, bring it on or like, or like looking forward <laughs> to me or something next race. And then afterwards, I was like, oh, no, he's going to take me out. He's going to crash into me. <laughs> so, yeah, was that is cool. great. Was- That's what you got to do, bro. That's the attitude I'm talking about. We'll bring it on. <laughs> I yeah. love it. That's great. Yeah, it's, uh, I saw him at the test that I did just a couple like a week ago. Yeah. Um, he smiled and wait, said hi to me. Uh, so I don't think there's any like bad blood between us. Um but I gotta watch out for him this week. <laughs> hey, listen, if we're if we're if you're at a race and I'm at the race and something happens, I'll be there for you, bro. How about that? Perfect. I'll, I'll be your Ty Domi. How about that? I'll be your Ty Domi. You Full just body me, yeah, I'll just I'll, I'll, you leave yeah, yeah. him alone. Yeah, it's torn. Okay, so then the one that I think to, to me that was the eye opener was you beat Josh Hayes in the next race. And if, if people who don't know, if you're watching this, you know Josh Hayes is literally an American. Icon. He's a Hall of Famer. Big Ten. He may be, I might be going on a limb here, but he might be one of the top five American writers of all time, which is saying a lot with Nikki Hayden, Ben Spees, uh, going back to Colin Edwards. And Josh Hayes might be one of the top five of all time, and you beat him and got a podium. I mean, first of all, did you even know anything about Josh Hayes? Oh, yeah. I've heard about Josh Hayes tons. Like, I used to watch Moto America when I was, when I was just riding small bikes. I used to watch it. And, um, I've heard his name like tons and uh, he was one of the riders that I was like, I was actually looking forward to riding with um, before the weekend. And once we actually got there, he was one of the guys that took me on a track walk. So I was, I was doing the track walk of Coda with Josh Hayes um, nice. and I got to talk to him. Really nice guy, super genuine, um, lots of, lots of good tips and everything. And he has his, he has his, like, I guess you could say old school style, um, and I have I have a different approach just with my the European new the new school I guess um, so it was a couple things that I that were that were a bit different in our riding styles for sure as, as uh, in as in what way in what way if you can uh, uh, talk to us uh, non initiated in what way well definitely if you look at the body positions he kind of sits a bit like upright you know a little 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 odd like I don't know personally I make fun of my dad when he rides like that because I'm like come on you look you're basically upright. Um, so yeah, Josh is very like crooked, I guess you could say. And I'm, I'm very elbows to the ground. I ride very, um, yeah, I drag a lot of elbow. So, um, it was very different in that style. And then it was just the way he approaches corners. It's just a, a tad bit different. Um, just with like, I was breaking differently than him and he was corner speed. Like his corner speed was actually quite better than mine and everything like that. And it could be that he's been riding that R6 for ages. Um, and I was my like sec first or second weekend on the bike. Um, but after the first race, when I saw him crash, I was a little bit disappointed, honestly. Um, cause he crashed out of the race one and I was a bit like, Oh, come on. Like I wanted to battle with you. Yeah. And then in race two, it was him and David Anthony again for the podium. Um, and yeah, it was great. I was in the moment. I see Josh as another competitor. I don't see him as the most winningest AMA rider ever uh, that he is. Like I, I don't see him like that. I see him as just another competitor. Um, after the race, I was like, oh, wow, like I beat Josh Hayes. Um, I beat him fair and square. There was no, there was no, no aggressive pass passing that I pushed him off or he didn't make a mistake. I just, I just beat him fair and square. And, um, he, he talked very good about me. Apparently I've heard a lot of people, I didn't hear the, he got a little, he got interviewed or something. And he said that I was the real deal. Um, so I, I, I think that was very nice hearing that from Josh. 
Um, and yeah, a lot of respect to Josh. Like I'm, I, I, I like, I like him a lot. He's very nice. Um, and yeah, seeing some of the photos, there's a photo where I'm standing Josh Hayes up. Like I, I'm in the corner and he's like this. Um, so we were definitely very aggressive with each other, yeah. um, which I like. I like how he didn't, he didn't try and take it easy or whatever with me. He was, um, and I didn't take it easy with him either. Uh, it was very, we were both very aggressive with each other and I liked it. Fair, but aggressive. What I love, man, was the vi- it's the video where you guys are coming out uh, uh, and uh, he does a wheelie. He's doing a wheelie and he looks over at you and you kind of look at him like uh, it's just beautiful. It's yeah. I mean it's you got to see. I can't if if anybody gets a chance go to YouTube and watch it. And the, the clip is maybe eleven seconds long, but it's so badass. I mean the way you look at him and he looks at you and he's as he's wheeling it. Oh shit! And that was even qualifying too. Like it wasn't even in the race that we got that happen yeah. it was in qualifying and we were we we're already battling in, from the first qualifying we were instantly we were exchanging aggressive passing we were we were battling like it was the race from the first qualifying so uh throughout the entire weekend we were we were building speed together and yeah that video was pretty cool i like that video man you know what i think coda probably is your uh I mean, that, that is your, okay, I'm good enough and I'm here moment because that's a hard track. I mean, yeah. I've heard GP riders, I remember Bradley Smith telling me, he goes, man, I, I can't ride this damn track. I, I, I can't. <laughs> and there's a lot, a lot of people that don't, don't really like it. And the fact that you came on a bike that you're not familiar with as a wild card and you kicked their ass. Yeah. I mean, you kick their ass fair and square. And who gives a shit? It's aggressive. Hey, man, it's a sport. Every sport's aggressive. And, you know, I mean, it, you bitch and, you know, get a dog if you get scared. Get a dog. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're out there. You know, you know what it's all about. So good for you. So that's why I say this year, I think uh, Zavi, Zavi's got to be definitely, you know, uh, considered uh, to be the returning champion. So he's got to be considered number one. But I'm looking at, I looked at the list and I'm telling you, man, I don't know. Is Rocco going to be there? So Rocco has signed to do baggers and twins again. Rocco's doing baggers? Yeah, he's on he's on a bagger this year. Oh my god. Rocco's yeah. doing a bagger. Did you see that? Did you see the talk I did with Rocco? Did you see that talk? Uh, I don't think I did, no. <laughs> Rocco was telling me, like, you know, I always ask a rider, you know, right before the race, what are they listening to? How do they get into their mental space? He listens to history podcasts on the grid while he's listening and getting ready for the race. History podcast. What a dork. And I told him that and we laughed. But I I mean, I, I respect the guy. He's a great sense of humor. I think Rocco's going to be great for the sport, especially for Americans, that is. But he's doing backers. Yeah, I thought it was a bit surprising, too. Like, I thought, oh, maybe he'll do super sport full time this year. Um, but, yeah, no, he's on baggers. And he's also doing twins with the new Suzuki that's just come out. Um, so, yeah, he's. He's, I think he's going for, I think, a second Twins championship. He's trying to go for that. And then, yeah, he's, he's on baggers. So I thought that was that was pretty cool. I personally, I think, I really think you, and I might be, like I said, speaking out a term here, but from what you did as a wild card in Coda, I said, this guy's got what it takes. And I just, I just think going through what you did overseas and all those championships and, and going through it, man, you and you got that one last chance, that one. It's almost like the Eminem song that you got one shot, and that's what you did. You made the most of it, and now, man, you you're coming sunny side up. But I just think you're gonna kick ass this year, bro. I really, I think you're gonna kick. And here's where I think we we have a, a little synchronicity is, is that I'm originally from Oklahoma. The team that sponsors you is Altus Motorsports. My uncle used to manage the Walmart there. Yeah. And you rode that GSX R S750. When I when I got back to riding again as an adult, the first bike I had was a GSX R750. So me and oh. you were kind of like this, bro. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think so. But yeah. I really, I really think this year, I see you in definitely in the top three. Where do you see yourself? Um, I think. Well, I was looking at just some people who signed. Like the the full official like a uh, rider list hasn't come out, but just seeing who signed P J Jacobson, he's in Super Sport now on a Ducati. Uh, Corey Alexander, he's on a Ducati. Uh, um, there's Tyler Scott's always fast. They they haven't announced the other M four rider yet, so most likely they'll be quick as well. Um, Does that intimidate you? Those guys, the big names. Uh, not really. It's just, I know that they're going to be quick, so there'll be good competition. Uh, I know PJ's, I've seen some of the Instagram videos of him. He was doing a test just like a day ago and he looks fast. 
He looks very fast on the bike. Um, so it should be, I think if I can finish top three in the championship, I'll be super happy. Um, I want to try and be on the podium or at least in the podium fight every single race. If I don't finish on the podium and I finish like fourth, that's okay with me. I'm, I'm, I'll be a little disappointed, but I need to be, my goal is top five every single race. Um, be consistent and then see if I can win a couple races. That'd be, that'd be ideal. Um, but yeah, I think, I think looking at the, the, the people who are probably going to be in it, it'll be a bit tough to be on, like to be top five, top three in the championship, but I think it's quite possible. What, um, what does Zavi have that sets him apart for all the other riders that you think it's hard for you to, that you'd be hard for you to beat him? And do you think you could beat him? I think it's the experience that he has. He's just, he's been everywhere. Um, he's been everywhere and he's been successful in almost everything he's raced in. Um, so it's just that, um, it's just, it's just, he's got, he's, he knows what he's doing. you right. He, he knows he's been in almost every single situation before. And when he's racing against these young guys who, yeah, we have, we might have the speed, but we might not have the, the perfect knowledge of what's, what to do when something happens. If someone starts pulling away, how do you close that gap? Like as youngsters, we're going to just be like, just go faster. And we're just going to try and push maybe Chavi, like he knows what to do. Um, so yeah, that's basically, he's, he's just, he just knows what he's doing. And I don't, I, I don't know if he's signed again for another year, but if he has, then it's going to be, he's going to be quick. Man, I, I think it's going to be a great year. I, I might just get the Moto America uh, package just for you, just for you, and maybe, maybe for Rocco, but just for you, because I want to see you get that super sport. I really, I mean, I love PJ. I think PJ is great. I thought he should have got more pub when he was over in World Superbike. He should have got more pub. He's a great rider. But, man, I think what you're doing is fantastic. I, I, I love it. I love your mental space. And your, in fact, your mom is a leadership coach. It has to give you a leg up mentally. Oh yeah, for sure. My mom, um, she really values the mental aspect of racing, which a lot of, a lot of people don't, um, like she was really, she, my mom was really big on getting me a mental coach, um, for when I was in junior GP. So I had that as well, um, for a little bit and like, uh, someone to talk, like, I we had a, I had a guy I used to talk to like outside of racing, um, to just help me not so that nothing outside of my racing was going to affect me. Um, and it was just purely going to be me on the bike, no, no distractions, no problems, just what I can do. Um, so my mom, she, she thinks it's very important to be mentally prepared, mentally ready, mentally strong. Cause that's the, oh yeah, the physical side. She says the physical side is 40% of it. And the mental side is 60% of it. Well, uh, well uh, now easier said than done because how old are you? 19? 18. 18. Okay. Okay. So you're a teenager, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I know you're in, you know, athletics, whatever, and you can be focused on what you got to do. But hey, we're all human. So there's got to be times when you're off the bike, and let's just say it's a Friday night, whatever, and it's off season, or, or maybe even in season, and you're like, hey, you know, hey, w what do you like to do to to let loose, and how do you make sure you don't let loose too much to where you're losing focus of what you got to do? Because you're 18. You I mean you you like? Uh, I know you. I don't know if I should put it out there. What about your per, uh, personal bit? We talked off air, but I mean, let's say like you know you like to go out and meet people or whatever so like how do you maintain that focus but still have an actual life um well it's it's interesting because when i was in europe a lot of the guys the all of my friends over there are all racers mm -hmm. um all of them in junior gp and we all have the same goal of staying focused on our racing so when i was in spain it was really only a couple of, like i think in one year we only went out as a group outside of like uh, outside of racing to hang out three times in an entire season. So not really much. We're all just, and when we hang out, it's we're training and we, we hang out, we, we joke around with all that. When I'm here right now in my off season, um, it's, I, I know what to do and what not to do. Like, and my parents make sure I know it. They're like, you can have fun. You can go out, you can let loose. You can, you can do what you want, but just be reasonable because you got to be seasons coming up. You don't want to get hurt. You don't want to do something dumb that you'll regret. Um, and also with racing, you never know what's on camera too, like who's filming. So if you do something that maybe shouldn't, maybe someone's a sponsor might not like that. You're just having fun. You're messing around with your buddies or you're doing something like messing around or you're 
you're drifting in a car or something like that, you might get in trouble if if it's on camera and someone finds out it's you. Yeah. So it's you got you always got to be smart what you're doing and making sure that you're being safe because uh, it's not just the racing part. There's also the the I guess you could say the what is it the the image your personal yeah. image that yeah. that matters a lot. Well, you don't seem like that type of guy, but are, you never know. I don't know how you are behind closed door. I mean, you you a wild guy that we don't know about, or you pretty much what you see is what you get. Uh, I can be a little like. With my actions, I can be a bit reckless sometimes. Like when I'm out with my buddies, we do yeah. some like we have fun. Um, nothing crazy. Like I'm not I'm not nothing that would get me arrested. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, I, I like to have fun. I like to enjoy my time when I when I have the chance to yeah. to to mess around. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, nothing nothing too bad. <laughs> nothing to get arrested. <laughs> There you go. You got to keep it all in perspective. Okay, so that I always ask every rider because I love the, this my mental approach. Like when you're getting on race day, walk me through it. How are you different during race day? From the moment you wake up, do you do you are you superstitious? Do you put one sock on, then one sock, you know, whatever? Or are you underwear on first, and do you stand up when you do it? Do you sit down? Does the right sock go on first, and then you get on the grid? Do you listen to music, or you or you don't like people to talk to you, or are you joking around? How are you on race day? Um. So I'm, I get quite stressed quite easily. Mm -hmm. um, so I try and make sure everything's non-stressful. Um, so the day before, I make sure everything's ready, like the helmet's ready, the gloves are ready to go, suits hung up, and there's no problem. Um, and yeah, it's basically, it's pretty normal, low stress. I get to the track, maybe like usually we have warm up in the morning. So but I guess we've already done warm up. I'm relaxed. I put my headphones on. I got these big headphones that I put on. A sound canceling so that no one no one speaks to me and I can ignore them. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's lately I've been into some more calm music, more like I really like Bob Marley actually. Really? Yeah. I I haven't. I've only I when I was at the test the other day, I even do it for tests. So I just put the music on to like get calm. Mm -hmm. um, I was listening to a bit about Bob Marley. He's pretty. I don't know. It gets me pretty calm. Um, like what song? What jamming or? Yeah, it's frozen. Uh, I just put on the whole Bob Marley playlist and it just goes through it. Really? Yeah, just listen. And it, it's pretty relaxing too. I was listening to it at work too while I was while I was organizing stuff. Nice. Now, and, and what, and what, did you, what did you just do before? Like what kind of music did you just do? Or did you? Like, like I said, Rocco does history podcasts, which I think is weird. So what did you listen to before? Was it hard or was it country? Or was it Inya? Or was it New Wave? Like what was it? It really depends the type of race. If I'm qualifying, like if I have a good qualifying and I'm going to be up there and I'm going to be in the heat of the battle the whole race, um, I definitely listen to try like some electrical, like hype up music um, to get me like in the mode to be aggressive. Yeah. If I'm, if it's raining or if it's more, I'm going to have a calm race, just some like basic, I guess basic playlist. I've got a tune, like a, a playlist called Relax. And it just, it's just anything to keep me calm. Cause otherwise I'm going to do something dumb. If I'm, if I'm too hyped up, I'm going to be smacking into people. I'm going to be getting <laughs> mad. Um, but if I want to just be focused and just like yeah. be consistent or like all that, something calm. Like Taylor um, Swift, any Taylor Swift? No Taylor Swift. I'm not a big fan <laughs> of Taylor Swift. <laughs> yeah, but what if, what if she ended up like, let's just say, for, for, she was just scrolling through YouTube, saw this, and was like, hey, that guy's kind of cute. And then she ended up, you know, Kelsey ended up screwing up. He's a football player. He ended up screwing up, getting caught, you know, whatever, some other chick. And she saw you, she goes, who's this kid here? And let's just say she goes, she came to one of your races. Let's say she came to one of your races. She saw you go, I like this guy. And you were like, eh, whatever. And then found out she really liked you. And she was in, like, say you won your race. Say, like, you and uh, Corey Alexander and, and, and PJ were battling. And you end up winning by taking uh, PJ wide. And you're feeling yourself. And you're on top podium. And somebody said, hey, Taylor Swift wants to meet you. What would you do? This, this, might, be, this might be harsh and controversial. But just her music's awful for me. And it's a deal breaker to me. Like, I, I wouldn't be able to. I just, I, I'd, I'd probably like, I'd just get like mad just the thought of the music. I'm like, oh no, like I wouldn't be able to. <laughs> Tell her to scram. I don't like her music. Yeah, Taylor yeah. Swift is there in her private helicopter with her entourage going, Tell uh, Torrin I want to meet him. Tell her her music is trash and I'm busy right now. Is that, is that, is that what you would say? Yeah. <laughs> You're lying, Torrin. Let me tell you something. She could buy your race team. You know how many motorcycles you could get? If Taylor Swift went out with you, you know how many motorcycles? She could buy your whole team, and then you're set, bro. You're set for life. 
Yeah, I know. My dad would probably scold me for it. He'd probably be like, Torrent, <laughs> just take one for the team. And you sh- she'll sponsor the racing. <laughs> take one for the team. Like, she's butt ugly. Just take one for the team. And Torrin, you can get paid. Like, I don't want to, Dad, her music. <laughs> yeah. Who would you rather have? Uh, 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 Taylor Swift, Rihanna. Who's another one? Uh, Dewey, Dewey Lipo, Lupo, uh, uh, Rodrigo. Any any uh, any of the big stars like make you go hmm? If they came to a race, I I, I try to win it just for them. Uh, I mean, other than my like my girlfriend, uh, <laughs> other than am my I, girlfriend, am, am I getting I, you in trouble? Am I getting you in trouble right now? I don't know. I, don't know. I think she'll understand. Um, I'd say I'd say Beyonce is pretty pretty nice. <laughs> oh my god, she'd be your cougar. Beyonce would be your cougar. Maybe. <laughs> I love it. There's that cocky attitude that Dave Anthony was talking about. Maybe. Yep. <laughs> so, so, you, so you take Beyonce over all of them? I think so, yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> now, you like her music? Do you like her music? Yeah, I like her music. I think her music's pretty decent. And you think she's so, hot? It's not, it's not something I'd listen to on the daily, but... Um, I think my mom liked quite a bit of Beyonce, so I mean, I've listened to it a bit, and it's it's not it's not like uh, it's not painful to listen to. You think she's hot? You think she's hot? For my girlfriend's sake, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say no. <laughs> that pause just gave you away. Anytime you pause, it gives you away. It's like it's like when you get pulled over by the cops. You been drinking? No. <laughs> so you You're gone straight away. <laughs> yeah. Listen, first of all, man, if your girlfriend's listening, she's watching. I, I'm just asking these questions, sweetie. I don't want you to get mad at me. And don't get mad at your man. These are just fun questions. He just really mm, with you. And what'd you meet her at, by the way? Is she an athlete or anything? Or how'd you meet her? Well, she, the high school that I was supposed to, because I did online high school, um, I was supposed to go in person, but then I chose online. She mm-hmm. went to the high school that I was supposed to go to, basically. So where all my friends went, all the people who I grew up with, that that school, she went there. And so um, I knew her from that aspect. And then we talked on Instagram for a little bit. And then, yeah. Oh, man, that's great. Dude, I mean, I mean, if an above, it, now, does that help you in a way? I mean, does it alter your focus, though, sometimes? Because sometimes the right person in your life is such an asset, but, man, the wrong person can bring you down worse than a bad bike or a bad crew chief. So, yeah, I mean, how does that, how does that help you as far as racing goes? I don't think, well, I made sure, like, before we started dating, to, like, she knew that I was racing, and I said, hey, my priority is going to be racing. It's, it's always going to be racing. Um, so... I need, we need to make sure that there's not going to be any problems and that when it's race weekend, I need to be focused and I can't be distracted. Um, and she's very understanding about that. She, she prioritizes my racing too. So if, if it's race day or race weekend, then it's very, there's no problems. We don't, we talk a little less just so that we, um, I can stay more focused. Um, but it's never, it's never, I've never had a problem with it and we've, it's worked perfectly. And if anything, it does help me just having someone that I can, um, talk to not about bikes because I, I like to at the end of the day of riding I like to just bikes are done like I'll, I'll dream about it I dream a lot so I, I'll be thinking about my riding then but once I'm away from the track I don't want I don't want anything to do with bikes I want to I want to I want to get it out of my mind so talking to her about just random stuff really helps now do you use visual visualization as part of your process to get mentally ready oh yeah for sure I um Sometimes, you know, some people do the, like the closed eyes and moving their body. For me, it doesn't, that doesn't work as much. I feel dumb doing it, honestly. Um, I'd rather just, I'd rather just like close my eyes or just like think about it. Cause I can think about stuff while my eyes are open. I don't have to close them to, to be focused. <laughs> yeah. um, I think I personally, I think that's a bit over the top doing the whole thing. I think that's a little, a little weird. I see people doing it. I'm like, you could just be thinking of it right now. You don't gotta, you don't have to do all that. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell Philip Earl you said that, and he's gonna come looking for you. How about that? I'm gonna tell uh, Philip Earl you said that. I mean, I understand, like, kind of, but I think, like, it's like it's the same thing as thinking. If you're racing, you just think about it. And like, I'm like right now, I'm thinking of Valencia laps. Like, it's it's as easy as that. I can be talking to someone, and I'm still I'm doing the laps, the lines, the everything, and that and that works for me. And I dream like a lot. Um, like, I've got a very I guess you could say creative mind. So um, when I'm asleep, I'm not sleeping peacefully i'm thinking about the riding 
Um, sometimes it gets annoying because I'm like, oh, I, I like I'm I, I I slept for like eight hours, but I feel like I haven't slept at all just because I've been thinking about it the whole time. Um, but I every time I sleep and I wake up the next morning, I'm significantly faster. I'm better rider just because I've been able to to take it all in and think about it. Now, if you weren't doing this, if you weren't racing, whatever, what would you be doing? If you didn't uh, fall in love with the, if you didn't fall in love with the bike life, what would you be doing? Honestly, I've been interested in like a little bit of American football. Um, like my friends played high school football and it honestly looks pretty fun. Um, cause something I, I wish motorbiking had more of is I guess the team, the teamwork, the team celebration. Cause yeah, you celebrate, let's say, let's say I was, let's say Jake Lewis is my teammate this year, right? Mm -hmm. If I got on the podium or I won the race and he did not my side of the team would probably celebrate and some of the team would, but his side would probably be a li little bit like disappointed if he crashed or something versus if a football team wins, everyone on the team is celebrating. Um, and it's your teammates aren't really your teammates. A lot of the time they're, they're your biggest competition. Yeah. Cause it's, let's say if, if I'm, if, if Jake wins every race this year, he's the face of Altus um, versus I'm, like he's the number one or something like that. So everyone's trying to be the best on their team because it, it's, it's, I don't, it's a natural thing for races. Rule number one, be your teammate. Um, it's, you always try and be your teammate no matter what. So I guess I wish there was more of a, a team aspect and that's why I'd probably do football or soccer or something that the whole team's involved because it's just that atmosphere is, is, is something I, I wish racing had more of the whole the big group celebrating, cheering, the loud, everything like that. Racing is very individual. So are you looking forward to like, I mean, I, I want to get into your goal goals, but is your, the goal, is it to come in, kick ass here at, in the super sport, win it and go back over to Europe and show them, hey, I, I, I'm, I'm bigger, stronger, faster. That was, I think that's right now, there's a couple paths that I could do. Um, if let's say I, everything went perfectly, I did amazing in this year in super sport, we could either try and consider world super sport mm -hmm. um, and see and, and try and go to the production side of world championships or go to European moto two um, and try, try doing it on the moto two bikes and see that's back to a GP frame. Um, so it'll be, again, I'll have to get used to that. Um, but I, I, right now I think I'm trying to put those goals to the side and just focus on this year and see what I can do. Um, Cause yeah, as, as, as you know, everything was expensive. And um, if I'm not on the podium, if I'm not winning races, there's not much income for, for me and my racing. Um, and so basically, it's really important that I do well this year so that I can fund whatever I'm going to, whatever my plans are next season. Now, are you going to live in the States or still in Canada for the season? I'm going to live here, back in, still at home. Um, and I'm, I think we're flying to most of the races. Um, Why don't you guys just move? Move to the states. Move to Austin, Austin, Florida. Ugh, but it's, the weather's good. So you got the Juju Monster lives there. You can move in with him. You, you guys can live, live together with Juju. Go to either Florida, go to Austin, or go to California. But then the problem is, there's only you still have to travel like oh, crazy. Jesus Christ. Man, this kid ain't listening to me. He ain't no, listening. because even oh, in the, even in California, it's miles away from like. Oh, uh, what's the ridge or something? Or like, I don't know if it's the ridge or the closest tracks. They're all really far. It's not that far from where I live. You take a Spirit airline. You can fly Spirit for thirty nine dollars. Then you know they charge everything else. But still, you can fly Spirit airline. We could do this. Move to America. You already. You still have your dual citizenship with uh with uh, Great Britain. Yeah. There you get a. Can you get triple citizenship? I don't know. Can you get triple citizenship? I don't know. I think the U.S. You might own, You might have to get rid of one of them to do it. <laughs> Well, get rid of your Canadian, and then you become an American, all right? And then you, uh, I mean, just for race season. British one. Oh, yeah. Okay, get rid of British. Yeah, because they're one and the same. We beat them in a war anyway. So what you do is you get an American citizenship, move to California, crazy California, just for race season. Okay, stay with Josh Hayes and Melissa. You stay with them as your base. You can train with your competition. You can, you know, you, you're the, the just watch him and, you know, feed his, I mean, take his brain out or whatever. You guys train together, and you get to the race together. You try to beat him, and you stay with them, save money up. You're in San Diego. San Diego has the best weather 
together in the country, in the country, almost the world. So there you go. Stay with Josh Hayes and Melissa. Yeah. I, I mean, like, I think me and my parents thought like considered it all um, and thought, but it's, it's honestly, I think part of me coming back from Europe is, is to be at home. Um, just cause I've, since I was what, I think I was last time I've been at home for a full year, I was 14, 13, 14. Let, let, let me talk to your mom. I'll, I'll, let me talk to you. I, I can smooth it over. I mean, she's the leadership coach. I'm strong mentally. I can get it done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how we do that? You can go, either live with Josh Hayes or you can live here in America, in Indianapolis. You live in my place. I'm always gone anyway. I'm hardly ever here. So I got a place. It's empty. It's like, a, it's like almost, my place is almost like a yoga studio. I mean, it really is. I have no furniture. I got three chairs. And then the place is yours. I'm gone all the time on race weekends. I'm all, I come home and then I watch you on TV on the Motor America, on the Motor America, uh, uh, whatever that little thing we go to. I, I get on the Motor America, watch you race, and then when I'm gone, you get my place again. You can stay here in America and you can train. Sounds tempting. <laughs> Man. Torin, this has been great talking to you, brother. I mean it from the bottom of my heart. I, I really think you're going to have a great year this year. I love where your headspace is at. You're in a, I mean, seriously, I, I, I knew this was going to be a good talk, but I, I just really thought what you went through with those four years and going, you know, British Talent Cup, European Talent Cup, and going through, the, you know, going through the shit and coming out how you are now, and when you got that podium, when I saw that you beat Josh Hayes, that to me was when I said, this kid's got something. So, man, I wish you nothing but the best this year, brother. Thank you so much. Before we get out of here, I always ask like the uh, top five, top five. So uh, when you're over in Europe or whatever, what's your favorite tracks? Your fa if you had to pick your top five tracks that you loved racing on, maybe not the best results, but the, the tracks you love the most. Yeah. Um, I think Valencia, just because it's... Oh my God, I love Valencia. That, it's, that, that's my favorite. Well, I mean, it's nothing, it's not like when you go there, it's not, it's not going to blow you away. There's nothing that's like stands out other than just it's a nice smooth flowing track um and it's just enjoyable to spend laps on um Porta Maya just because it's it's not very much it's not fun to race that just because it's it's really hard to put fast laps in and it's quite scary with the ups and downs um but it's beautiful it's an it's an experience that I think anyone who's big on biking should go there to just just spend laps and do a track day there because it's it's amazing i'm going there next uh, month i'm going there next month for, for gp it's really nice yeah, yeah. like especially the, there's the big like tabletop almost yes and even on the motor three bikes it comes up and if you're not careful it'll loop and it's um like in the races you, you see that they push it so that they keep it down because that's mm. the fast line but yeah. if you don't do that it, it'll completely nearly the whole way down wow um, yeah it's it's crazy and then I'd say Donington is a, is a nice one in England. I was, I I've enjoyed ridden, that track a little bit. I've ridden there. I've ridden there. I love, I love that track actually. That was, yeah, I think it was the first, I think it was the first European track I rode on. It was in Donington. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, yeah. It's, I like the, the crane of his curves, the, the downhill part. That's pretty nice. Yes. Uh, oh, Barcelona. Can't forget about that one. The, the circuit de Catalunya. Love that yeah. track. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. It's just this the whole experience, like the track itself. You, you're going down the main street, and it has those like over, those overhead like stands or whatever. Mm -hmm. and it's so cool. It's such a cool track to be at. Um, and that was the team. The team that I was on. It was their uh, their home their home race. So there was a lot of people coming to see the team and everything. And that was pretty cool. Um, and then Mizano. I've ridden Mizano, and that's a nice track too. Yes, I love Mizano. This that whole area is great, isn't it? Oh yeah, it was it was really cool because we got to do I think it was in 2022. Uh, Mo Junior GP went alongside World Championships, so we got to be there with the Moto GP boys and everything, um, and the huge fans and everything, and it was awesome. Wait a minute, what? Uh, who won in GP that year? And maybe the year I went there. Uh, okay, was that was that the one where it was uh, uh, the Vicioso's last last race? I don't think so. No, I think that was that was like a couple years before or okay. something. Okay, okay, okay. I, I thought I was there a year, but I guess not. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that, and did you, did, you, did you get a chance to go to Rossi's Ranch? Uh, I've never like I've never been. Um, I have a couple friends who've been invited there, um, but I think he often doesn't like invite anyone who's not World Championship. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Italian food or poutine. 
I honestly don't like poutine at all. Really? I think it's, I, I really think it's, it's Fresh. just disgusting. Personally, the gravy, it's like, it's like if I wanted wet fries, I would have gone and like put some water on it instead. Like, <laughs> I don't think it's very good. So yeah, definitely Italian food. Is that your favorite food? Is that your favorite food? Oh yeah. I like Asian food. Like I, um, yes, I like, I like Filipino food. That's pretty nice. Uh, okay, uh, I I say I like pad thai. It's like I like Italian food and then pad thai and then hibachi. Mm-hmm. I'd have to say Filipino food, pizza in particular, not just all Italian food, but like pizza, like a good pizza, yeah. um, not North American crap, like like proper European pizza. Uh, yes, yes, uh, yes. And then sushi. I think you can't go wrong with sushi. <laughs> What's your favorite, favorite role? Favorite sushi role? I'd say tuna. I think you can't like just a nice tuna, the one where it's just rice and then tuna on top. Okay. Like uh, not the proper roll, but just like the little, you know. I think that's pretty nice. Okay. 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 So okay. So in five years, where are you going to be, Torin? You're only going to be eighteen, twenty. You'd be twenty three years old. Where do you want to be at twenty three? Where do you want to be? Ideally, I'd like to be in Europe, racing in Europe. Um, whether it's in year maybe i i say like world championships a bit of a push i i, I think that's a little far-fetched um i'd say world super sport is a like that that's a realistic goal to be racing in that or just in that championship like with world Superbike. um i'd say that's quite realistic um so i'd say probably there probably based out of somewhere in europe for sure I th- i'd like to i'd like to live in france i feel like that would be nice even though you hate the french riders you want to live in france I don't hate like French people as, as a total. It's just, there's a couple, I think there was like two or three of them in junior GP that I just didn't like. I just was not a huge fan of. I just, I just, no, I'm just, it's kind of rubbed me the wrong way with them after that. I was like, okay, you know what? I don't want, I don't want to interact with them anymore. Now, well, we're in France, so where Paris or, or Lyon or? Um, it's not, not in a city. I want to live like a little bit in the countryside. Um, I feel like that would be more enjoyable just it seems like a pretty nice, fresh country. I I, I I love France. I mean, I only went once. I want to go back again. I want to go to Le Mans, but I don't know if I have the chance to do it. But I, I love, had a great time in Paris. It's almost stereotypical. The food and everything was just great. I think I think living on the uh, the uh, the French countryside would be awesome. Oh, yeah. It's, I, we have uh, some family friends that live in the countryside over mm-hmm. there. And we've been there before. And I haven't been since I was really young. But I, I still... I still, when I think of it, it still reminds me of like the nice, the nice big fields, the open space to run around, do what you want. It's, it's nice. Are you, so are you like a Canadian country boy, basically? Uh, I wouldn't say I'm country. Uh, I'd say I'm like, I live in Alberta. It's like, it's basically like the, I guess you could say the Oklahoma of, of, of Canada. Yeah. Yes. It's pretty, there's a lot of, there's a lot of country kids around here. I'm pretty, I live in the suburbs, so, um, yeah, but you see a lot of people with cowboy hats and cowboy boots on and all of that. So because yeah. the rodeo, big, yeah, for sure. There's like the the Calgary Stampede is really famous. Um, I'm glad, so yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you said Oklahoma because I grew up born and raised in born and raised in Oklahoma, and I just remember riding my mo- I could ride my motorcycle anywhere. I was a kid, and we had like a I rode in the church parking lot. It was catacorn and us. And my in my uh, yard, I had two backyards and, and there was a side yard and I had natural whoops. Like it was the weird because the, the way the ground was like this. So, so every time I would watch Supercross and I go outside and I could really ride like they did because it was natural whoops. And it was, I had the greatest of both worlds. So yeah, a lot of land just to ride motorcycles in. That's the greatest thing in the world you can do, man. I, I really, think that's in my, in the, my ideal in the future is when I'm older to have like a, a plot of land and just, just be able to ride, build a little track, like a little something. I know Jake Lewis has a, has like got a, like a flat track situation with like jumps and everything in it, in his back garden. I think that's crazy. Dude, you got to come down to America, man. We got to hook up. I mean, seriously, I, I, are you guys going to, only the baggers are racing against with MotoGP and Coda. So uh, if you get close, 
I'm going to try to make it down to a, a Moto America race. I, I really want to see you race in person, man. I think you have a lot going for you. You are you are a great talk to, man. You're a great. I want to get more out of you just out of the, I, other than racing park. I, I think you'd be a lot funnier, man. I love the Beyonce line you got. I don't want to get you in trouble, though. But seriously, I wish you nothing but the best, Torrin. I think you're going to have a great year. With Altus Motorsports, I think it's a great uh, a great team to be a part of, man. I think you're going to do uh, big things this year. So anything else you want to say before we get out of here? Um, just thank you so much for having me. Oh, man, don't be Canadian nice now, man. You're, dude, you're, you, you, seriously, you're worth it, man. I'm glad you were uh, uh, gracious enough to do this again. It, we tried it before. We had a bad internet hookup where he was, and then you came back. I thought you were giving me the business, but you were man of your word, and you came back. And, man, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, tell your girlfriend I'm sorry if she gets pissed off. Tell her to get pissed off me, not you. You're a great guy. And uh, why, by the way, what would you get her for uh, Valentine's Day? What would you get her? I got a big bouquet of flowers and a uh, <laughs> teddy bear. <laughs> you big softy. All right, well, good for you, man. So I hope she doesn't watch it. But if she does, it's my fault, sweetie, not his. It's my fault. I'm the one that asked the question. So thank you, Torin. I appreciate you, man. Good luck to, uh, this year. I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you guys for watching Tales from Gemini. I'm BT. And like we say about this time, you know the word. Pay.